Nice to see you all. I hope you're all uh, having a good morning. Um, firstly, I want to say um, apologies in advance if this is a little bit scatty. Uh, I only kind of found out that I'd be doing this uh, last week whilst I was away camping. So I'm already spending more time in a tent than I was expecting to this summer, actually. Got some wet feet as well. Um, but um, yeah, so my name's Tom. I'm, uh, I work at Good Energy. Uh, you may or may not have heard of Good Energy. We were one of the um, one of the first suppliers of 100% renewable energy in the market. Um, but today, crucially, I want to talk to you about some of the challenges we face in how we generate, consume, and share energy more effectively. So you know, in the context of sustainability, um, there's, there are huge challenges that we do face in, in actually getting to that tipping point. And you know, listening to Caroline earlier, um, one of her key points was, you know, why should anyone care, right? So um, one of the key challenges in amongst all of this stuff, apart from the technology, um, you know, all, whether we're talking about battery storage, um, smart networks, all of these things, the technology is getting there, but actually the challenge is getting people to care. Um, so I want to talk through through that a little bit this morning. So um, I've been working in digital for sort of 10, 15 years, mostly in uh, technology startups, uh, predominantly in Bristol, actually. Um, one, of, one of the last places I worked, I started a business with a friend of mine, Toby. Uh, we ended up building an app called Money Hub, which is a, a personal finance app, um, which... Uh, it was designed to really give customers um, a, a real clear picture over where their money is and where it's all gone as well. Um, and ultimately, what, what we did was we, we, we were able to get customers to, to understand their money in a much better way, um, to, um, to feel like they really are in charge of their money. Uh, and as a result, actually, what we found was that through data and insights, we were creating smarter behaviors in customers. Um, we were going from the old world of banking which is very much around, you know, out of sight, out of mind. The less I look at my bank account, the happier I'm going to be, probably, through to actually I'm in charge of my money. I know where it is. I know where it's going. I know how to start making better choices as well. So, um, yeah, we had, we had a lot of success at Money Hub. Um, discovered that, that customers really started to change their own behavior. Um, and we've seen since then... Uh, you know, Money Hub is, is successful, but actually, you look at the likes of Monzo. You know, a bank that's that's come about. It's, it's not the only one out there, but it's one of a few now who've really understood that uh, providing customers with clarity, um, with a sense of control over their finances, enables them to actually uh, build trust with customers and to reach a tipping point of behaviour that enables them to actually, frankly, sell more products and services. They create an ecosystem. Um, in which customers will will trust and value what they're getting from their bank, which is kind of a big change. Um, <clears throat> I think you know one of the key things that enabled them to do that was they really focused on the digital experience, both from a data perspective, so making data rich and available to customers, even those who are more tech minded and wanted to integrate that banking data into their own app if they wanted to. You know, Money Hub, for example, we integrated with Monzo quite early on so that Money Hub users could um, could see their Monzo data in, in the same place. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, the, this focus on data, this focus on the ability to, to really understand everything that's going on in your own financial world. Um, yeah, so ultimately that, that's proven hugely successful for them. Um, because of that focus on data and also because of that focus on on the overall digital experience. Um, you know, Monzo really nailed that, for example. So being able to to sign up for them, you do a little video, you look at your phone, the whole thing is quite sort of delightful and enjoyable almost to, to use. So um, about two years ago, I moved to Good Energy. Um, and uh, I don't know how, how much you've heard about us as a business. We're one of... Uh, only three suppliers now in the market that Offgem have recognised as being truly renewable. So we've um, talked about derogation from the price cap recently. It's not particularly exciting wording, but what that really means is that uh, Offgem have acknowledged that the way we do business is different to others out there. Um, and you'll see there are lots of renewable energy suppliers or su supposed renewable energy suppliers in the market who use a bit of greenwashing, a bit of fudging to... Um, make themselves look more renewable than they are. And recently, we we talked quite a lot in the media about Shell Energy, 
who were, were first utility, they got rebranded as Shell when Shell bought them. And overnight, they went from about, um, I think around 3% renewable in their mix to 100%. Uh, didn't make a lot of sense when you actually dig into it. And it turns out that they were using um, what are called renewable energy guarantee of origin certificates. So basically, um, they're like organic stickers almost. So you can buy green organic stickers and stick it on the brown power that you've bought over the year. So we don't do that. We buy our power directly from renewable energy sources. So we have agreements in place with around 1,400 renewable generators across the UK, whether that's wind, solar. Um, I should know all of these, but I don't. <laughs> um, so um, we're also one of the largest independent feed-in tariff administrators. Um, so that what that means is if you've got solar panels on your roof or you've got a small wind turbine in your garden and the government is paying you for some of that ener energy that you're generating, uh, we're one of the key uh, administrators of that and you work through us to do that. <laughs> Feed and tariff schemes coming to an end, but we're, we're looking at other ways in which we can actually make it worthwhile to keep generating your energy at home because obviously we, we believe fundamentally that uh, this is all part of our future sustainable approach to energy generation. So around the time I joined, um, <clears throat> Good Energy had just kicked off its uh, its smart metering project. Um, so this is sort of mid twenty seventeen. Uh, technically, we were sort of a bit behind the curve, but actually, we were looking at waiting. <laughs> we were going to wait for the second generation of smart meter, which I don't know how much you guys know about. But um, the first generation of smart meters, Smets one meters, haven't had great press. They're not interoperable, so if you move energy supplier, suddenly your smart meter doesn't work or at least it's not smart anymore. Um, SMETS 2 meters we thought were, were better. They could do more. Um, not only were they interoperable, um, but also gave us an opportunity to do something different with the data. Um, that's why it was really exciting for me, having worked at MoneyHub and looked at how data and insights can drive customer engagement and, crucially, change in behavior. What a great opportunity with smart metering. Um, Juliet. Our, uh, our chief exec and founder, she kind of led the charge and said, look, if we're going to roll out smart meters, I don't want to be putting more LCDs and plastic into people's homes. So let's find a better solution. Go find one. Um, so we focused on mobile development. Uh, initially working with, with an agency, but then in-house, we, um, we started looking at ways in which we could actually use the devices people already have to engage with their energy usage. Could we do more than simply provide what a smart meter provides in terms of here's my usage right now, here's my cumulative usage over a month, here's what my uh, my bill looks like, uh, and instead actually do something more useful. So again, going back to Money Hub, what we one of the key things we did that drove engagement was we used some machine learning to um, to categorise all the transactions going in and out of customers' accounts. So um, <clears throat> for example, if you shopped at uh, Tesco all the time, it would pick up the different Tesco stores. It would work out the ones that um, were petrol stations and not <laughs> grocery stores. So we could actually categorize that spend as travel or fuel rather than groceries. And actually that builds up a better picture. And we thought, well, could we do that kind of thing in energy? Could we potentially break down that sort of spiky energy usage going on in a customer's home and kind of work out broadly, well, what, what's consuming that energy, what appliances, what kind of appliances, what kind of activities. Um, so we started playing with this idea of actually um, using a bit of machine learning again, actually, to, um, <clears throat> to start categorizing these things. And we're working with a partner at the moment who's it's very much experimental, but we're, we're hoping that we're able to roll out something with a high degree of accuracy that at least over a month can give you a breakdown over um, you know, where your energy is being spent in your home effectively. Um, but also drive some insights. So compare that to other people in similar size homes. Compare that to, um, let's say, this same month last year. You know, what's changing in your home? How could you respond to that potentially by, I don't know, it might be that your boiler's packing up and actually your gas usage has gone through the roof to heat your home at approximately the same temperature that it was last year. Um, so... Uh, I guess the the key thing that, that we're focusing on, therefore, is this idea that we can start a tipping uh, point of behavior change if we can 
create compelling, engaging, delightful, simple experiences. Um, rather than simply focusing, and I think a lot of what's going on in the industry is focusing on the technology and simply do we have all the bits in place? Do we have uh, solar panels? Do we have batteries? Do we have electric vehicles? Do we have all these things? Um, how do we create a tipping point in behavior? So it's early days. I mean, we don't even know for sure this is actually going to work. <laughs> I'm not putting this up particularly as a suggestion that this is going to change everything at all. In fact, um, we're pretty sure that version one won't. And actually, I think that the, the process that we're trying to run through is how do we, how do we iterate and evolve uh, a design or uh, an experience based on that feedback loop? Um, we'll come back to that a little bit. But what is, what's the goal? What are we actually trying to achieve? Um, so firstly, if we're going to move to renewables, move to a more sustainable supply, sustainable is quite a broad word, right? Actually, you could say there's something quite difficult to sustain about renewable energy generation. Now, I shouldn't really be showing this. Um, I did sort of quietly check with a couple of colleagues. This is something we share internally. I've taken some numbers off it. But um, this shows our generation at Good Energy. Um, this was over a week in July, I think, versus our, um, our customer demand. And you can see, this is over, over five days, the light green is the spike in solar. So you can see where we've had sunnier days towards the end of the week um, and where we've got wind in the dark green as well. There's also bio and hydro. Um, <clears throat> and um, that's quite hard to manage. That doesn't look like a nuclear power plant that's just running constantly or can potentially just move with demand. So solving that problem is, is going to be quite complex and it only gets more complex at scale. So, you know, when we're potentially running at sort of quarter of or up to a, a quarter of the uh, fuel mix on the grid being renewable, great, um, we can manage that. But when we're trying to aim at something perhaps close to 100 percent, there's whole new challenges that we need to to face. So, um, so we're looking more and more at things like uh, like battery storage. Uh, I think electric vehicles are quite well timed in a sense. I want to talk about those a bit more as well. Um, you know, the the modern home we think is increasingly going to look like this if we're going to meet this this, this demand, this problem. So uh, it's great that the government is looking at ensuring that all new new build homes come with solar panels. The standard, this kind of idea that why wouldn't you, is great because I think that's all about again behavioural tipping point. Um, but the, yeah, the, the issue comes when actually you do some of this at scale. So how do all these things interplay with each other? Um, how do we ensure that uh, energy, that there might be an excess of energy in a certain region if there's lots of solar and it's the middle of the day, everyone's out, um, and balance that in areas where there's a deficit of energy? What it requires is actually for us to move almost en masse into smart homes. It's all very well into one in... 50 of these of our homes looking like this. We kind of need to get to a tipping point where this technology becomes the default, it becomes the standard. Um, I say this, it might not be exactly this, but it's what we're working towards. Um, <clears throat> ultimately, you need to take people from that point at which they're just dipping their toe in or sort of wondering what it's all about. And again, that's what we're trying to do at the moment is get people to engage with their individual usage in their home, not simply oh, I buy from a renewable power generator and therefore I'm doing my bit. I mean, great, come join us. <laughs> but um, how do you play your part? How do you become part of that community that wants to generate energy, share energy, consume energy in a sustainable fashion um, and really go to that point where you're diving right into it, you're excited um, and you're enthusiastic? You know, we talk about early adopters. Um, what drives early adopters is that excitement usually about new technology, but it's not the same as generating a mass market need. So yeah, going back to this, the technology actually is about as simple as I can make it look. You know, actually, with a lot of the technology that gets talked about in sort of industry conferences that I've been to, they all look incredibly complex as much as you try and simplify it you know a consumer is not going to understand this stuff it really just gets far too complicated and everyone just goes no forget it someone can just sort this out for me but 
This is what an electric car looked like to all of us 10, 15 years ago. This is the gee whiz. Um, we look at that and we're reminded of all the reasons why um, moving to an electric vehicle is hard. Oh, batteries are heavy, they run out, charging it takes ages, you know, they're too expensive, they don't have enough range, technology isn't there yet. Um, you look at the anatomy of an electric car, it's not actually that different to what we now see as an electric car. And the reality is the only, the only true difference is the excitement, is the experience. Actually, that will get you from A to B, but you'll think of your brain, your amygdala, will think of all sorts of reasons not to do it. Now I want any excuse to get into that, right? <laughs> and it was no mistake that what Tesla did was create, um, create ludicrous mode, right? Which most, most of them don't actually have. But nonetheless, it generates this sense of excitement that gets people to say, well, do you know what? I'll put up with the fact that it's going to be quite expensive. I'll pay the difference. Um, you know, I'm doing my bit and I look great whilst I'm doing it. Um, uh, and suddenly those excuses start to, um, they're still there. Some of those issues are real, but we now have demand. We now have a reason to overcome them. Suddenly these things are things that we want to overcome rather than a, an excuse not to do it. So I think the same is going to be happening, we're starting to happen in, uh, in energy generation in general, in sustainable renewable generation. So this was, you um, don't need to see in detail, I know this screen's probably a bit small for you, some of you at the back. A key point here though is that a uh, bunch of energy executives were surveyed uh, a year or so ago, and these are the reasons that they gave for a sustainable, renewable, decentralized grid uh, to, these are the reasons that they weren't, that it wasn't gonna succeed. Um, and again, it's reflective of where electric cars are at, right? So all of these things might be true, slow development of storage technologies, government policies, insufficient investment by the government, insufficient investment by energy companies, weaknesses in transmission and distribution. So all those, th those things may well be true, but if we can instill that tipping point of excitement, engagement, purpose even behind doing it, that it goes way beyond your, you know, your eco warrior or your, um, uh, your tech early adopter and actually becomes mainstream. Um, I mean, going back to Tesla, they've created a market. Suddenly you've got other manufacturers who are building cars around that idea of excitement and electric propulsion uh, in the same way. We think that actually at the heart of it is customer engagement. Um, <clears throat> crucially, the user experience. So, you know, Tesla created an all round user experience that was simple, not scary, but fundamentally delightful at pretty much every stage. You know, the buying process, I haven't got one, by the way. Uh, <laughs> should point that out. Um, but um, you know, that whole experience of, Owning it, buying it, having it is um, is is delightful, and it and it makes it a much more compelling option. Suddenly, doing the right thing is kind of the fun thing as well. So they've they've really nailed the user experience, and I think, particularly sitting here in a sort of digital context, my role at Good Energy is very much around. Um, initially, I was sort of focused on how do we use digital channels to get new customers into into the business and, and grow the business, but actually. The realization was that we didn't have the maturity yet to give them a good experience. You know, we were very reliant purely on our call center, which was overrun. Uh, customers were on hold for a long time. Uh, our digital channels sucked, like our website wasn't great. We had a mobile app that was very um, low performing, as are many of the energy suppliers, to be fair. Um, so I've ended up really focusing on, on digital product development. How do we get our mobile, our web experiences into a really good place? Um, and now we're starting to see that we're getting some success out of that. Um, and we believe that actually if we carry on on this journey from let's get the basics right, let's get that experience of being a good energy customer as delightful, as easy as possible, we drive more engagement with our with our purpose, with our vision um, and, and our aims. So um, taking that forward then, uh, you know, moving into this smart enabled experience, 
our plan, our aim is that the more we can engage customers with the energy usage in their home, uh, the more we can engage with, uh, we can get them to engage with, uh, you know, what other people are doing as well, how they can play their part. Uh, we think, you know, the more sticky the whole concept is and the more we drive that behavioral change. So, like I said, there are lots of reasons, lots of reasons not to do it. But uh, that, as soon as you start offering that, that delightful, exciting, compelling experience, you find reasons to overcome those problems rather than reasons to, you know, the showstoppers basically go away. Um, so how do you create a delightful user experience? We have to appeal not just to our logical brains, but to our, again, our, our amygdalas, our, the kind of the doorkeeper in our brains, which is saying that good, that bad. And it's, you know, very simple emotional led decisions often that we make. So we often underplay the value of good design. And that isn't just uh, a well-structured design, something that is easy, thoughtful, um, enables customers to get through a channel effectively. It's also about surprise and delight. And um, that creates a much higher level, or perhaps lower level actually of engagement, that sort of deeper um, emotional response to something they see, even in energy usage. More practically, 83% um, of people say that a seamless experience across all devices is really important to them. So it's almost like a hygiene factor. Why would you not expect to have the same experience across maybe a you know, desktop or a mobile or whatever it might be? So thinking always about where customers are, what their needs are, what they use, and how those things can vary a lot to drive ultimately different decision making. So ultimately, um, to sort of round up really uh this is a big part of good energy's sort of investment focus you know, this isn't a financial presentation there are lots of other things we're doing but um if we're going to succeed in this area around engaging customers it's kind of three things that we need to focus on as a business and we're starting to do more and more and this is quite a journey for us so we've got experience data and ultimately underpinned by creativity it's really hard to nail those three things Experience is kind of the last bit that comes together. Um, historically, we're a 20-year-old business. It's very, very typically of a business like ours. We haven't been very good at data historically. We've um, we've done lots of tactical building of databases, building them in, um, whether it's using, uh, I don't even know the technology, everything from kind of access databases to really basic stuff that had never had interoperability and um, web and mobile tech in mind. Uh, it's meant that it's been a real challenge for us to simply get customer data out to customers in an efficient, seamless, consistent way. Um, so we've really had to get into the weeds and think about how we've changed the fundamental technical architecture of a lot of, a lot of our data. How do we get it to a point where, you know, regardless of whether, it's, let's say as a customer, I could be, I could have solar panels on my roof, be a feed-in tariff customer, but I also take supply. Good Energy, for example, up, up until recently, saw that as, well, as two systems, two products, you're basically two different people, and we don't join the dots. So how do we change that? And this is what we've started to achieve now. So our, our new mobile app, you can log in as a customer, you will see all of that data in one place due to some pretty heavy lifting and wrangling and pain and gnashing of teeth behind the scenes to make it all work. Um, the other challenge then, I think, again, as a 20-year-old business that isn't a little startup, how do you foster creativity? How do you um, how do you solve problems for customers in new and different and exciting ways to drive that that level of engagement that that we think we need to achieve? Um, I don't have all the answers to that, but we've been uh, we've been working for a little while on a sort of lightweight version of what you call a digital hub. We've had a digital team in place in house rather than trying to outsource creativity to an agency. We've looked to kind of get that in the business. We've got some fantastic people at Good Energy who are incredibly passionate, incredibly knowledgeable. Uh, some of them might not be great at digital, but then we've got some people who are great at digital, but don't always see the big picture. So how do you bring all that together to start creating new ideas that you can actually execute on? Um, and that's, that's a core fundamental challenge, I would say, for any established business that's been around the block and is being disrupted at the moment by, by startups. I'm sure many people here 
doing their best to disrupt a lot of established businesses, those businesses need to respond. And I think finding a way to foster creativity and innovation is the key to success there. And often that means taking people out of their day-to-day -day a bit and creating hubs in which that environment enables people to succeed. Um, yeah, and ultimately then focusing on the experience. So uh, in the last year or so, we've started um, some new, hopefully good habits, as I call them, uh, things like actually talking to our customers, which seems really obvious, but uh, we've never historically done enough of, apart from our great people on the phones. Um, so it's starting to surface that knowledge around, but also directly creating usability sessions on some of our new products that we're building. Uh, we now have this habit where at least once a month, we pre-booked, we know that we're going to be speaking to customers. We're going to interview five or six. We're going to show them something and ask them some questions or even just find out more about them and what they care about. Um, we may not know in two months what we're going to use that session for yet. Are we going to test a new piece of mobile development? Are we going to test out a tariff on them, for example? Uh, but we know we're going to do it. So it's getting us into that habit. So yeah, that's one of one of many things that we're trying to do. And I think my core message really is that if you're going to create a tipping point, you need to drive that level of excitement, engagement, and that will only come by actually really understanding your customers properly. And then also, technically speaking, serve them with data and insights, insights more than data, actually, um, that will engage and drive behavior change. So yeah, I think that's it from me. But uh, thanks for your time.